Welcome to another exciting class of 7th grade social studies. We are looking forward to today's lesson because it's all about mummification. We're going to talk about the whys, the whats, the hows, and everything in between to help you ace our test that's coming up. Yes, coming up quickly. So, uh, what is mummification? Well, first of all, it's an Egyptian method of embalming and treating the body to last an eternity. That's a long time. Like long, that. long time. Embalming, just kind of like getting rid of the internal fluids, blood, that type of stuff, to make sure the body doesn't rot. Yeah, so, yeah basically you're removing all the moisture so yep. it won't decay. And uh, the reason why is they want to preserve the body in a lifelike manner. Yeah, because we're talking about the afterlife, and we saw on the videos that we've done, the body, like I like to analogize or symbolize it to beef jerky, just kind of dried up gross. But in the afterlife, you want to be just like this afterlife, so you gotta have some resemblance of a real body. Yeah, and they thought that this actual body would be physically resurrected, so they wanted to keep it as, as lifelike as possible. Yep, very close, but over 2,000 years, over 3,000 years of this process, they've done pretty well. Yeah, they developed and perfected the mummification process to the point where we see a 3,000-year-old mummy and we can kind of tell what they looked like in life. Yeah. So to get started with the mummification process, we'll rotate to one of our many other cameras. First, we need linen. We need things to wrap the body with. We need spices. If you're going to dry out a body, if we're going to have eternity forever, we want good spice. Seasoned salt works well. Oh yes. You need a sharp metal rod to help dig out some of those trickier organs. Scapula, because when we cut open bodies, a nice sharp knife is definitely going to be better on that. I call it a scalpel. Scalpel. Yep, that's the better word for it, not scapula, scalpel. The coffin. Yes. You need a coffin. This is a small one, but we're going to make it work. And of course, if we're going to mummify something, you need a dead body. Thank you for volunteering. Yes. Now, as you can see, at the different angles, part of this is ripped open, but it would be a whole body. No openings, nothing like that. The biggest thing would probably be a hole for a needle because they drain the fluid from that. Because the internal organs are gross, we're going to become doctors. I don't know if doctors actually do what we did by blowing into the gloves, but it makes you look really cool, so we're going to do it anyway. I saw it on Grey's Anatomy. Yeah, that, that was my go-to as well. So the first thing they're going to do is get rid of the organ they think is absolutely worthless. What would that be like? Fingernails? Fingernails that, no, actually, they want to get rid of the brain. Oh yeah, the brain. But we're gonna check in with our scientific experts here real quick to explain why the brain is actually important in today's world. It's debatable, but let's check with them. As you can see, this is the brain. I don't think that was supposed to happen, was that? Probably not. But the, the brain, the brain is the, the, the most important organ in your body. Um, it is the center of your nervous system. Uh, all of the information from the outside world is processed by your brain. It is made up of thousands and thousands of tiny little cells, each communicating with each other at blazing fast speeds. Faster than the school's internet, am I right? Um, your brain, it connects to your spinal cord, which allows the information to travel to the rest of your body. Um, at speeds of approximately 268 miles per hour. I did not know that. Fun fact, a uh, 100 mile an hour fastball travels too fast for your brain to comprehend. And the people who hit it just do it based off of instinct. Oh, so that is fun. 
Muscle memory. Muscle memory. Mm. Brain weighs about three pounds. This is part of it. The rest is on the floor. And it was one of the things, as Mr. Langel told you, that the Egyptians took out during the mummification process. I have a question, and this may be a class discussion question. When did people get mummified? At what age, do you think? I don't know. We'll have to ask Mr. Langel. You guys talk that. about that. Because when do you think your brain stops developing? At what oh, age? Easy. At what good age? Good point. Very good point. Uh, 23? Nope. 25? 24? Nope. <laughs> one more? 26? Nope. Well, down one more. 25. 25. 25. So, by the time you are 25, your brain is still developing. So are you saying that these middle schoolers don't know everything? Correct. What? That is what I am saying. No. Chris. Have you asked any of them? Mm, I probably should. We should probably talk about that in class. Okay. Back to you, Mr. Langle. Thanks, experts. But the Egyptians disagree. They did not think the brain was worthwhile at all. One theory I, theory I read was that they thought that the brain just produced mucus. Which makes sense since they go up the nose with their metal tool to just kind of shove it up there and just start digging, digging, digging. And just pull it out. Oh, that's just a small piece. Of small piece. That you. But as you dig, and like I said, it's gonna look weird, in my opinion, because you're just scraping, 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 until you get all this. Now, this is whole brain. Scraping out, you're gonna get like little pieces of it, not actual image. And so, boy, take care of that brain. Uh, since it's not important, uh, we got a place where we put stuff that's not very important. Just right there, right in the trash. Which is still, makes sense when we think about how the Egyptians think. We'll talk more about the organs later. But also just really weird. Yeah, it's very strange. Should we pause for this question though? Why would they throw the brain out? Yeah. So, uh, a question for us to ponder, I mean, we're thinking about it now, is why would they throw the brain out? Because they really thought it was useless. I guess so. The other organs just played such a bigger value to their lives, mm -hmm. which makes sense. But also, brain just for mucus formation, who knows? And who knows? also, uh, we've been uh, researching studying and it seems like they tied the thoughts in your soul to your heart. So uh, they, they obviously thought the heart was more important. And uh, we're just going to go with what the Egyptians thought were important for the rest of this mummification process. Right. The next step is to get everything else out. So I take my scalpel, my scalpel, and they would always make a small incision on the left side of the body. Always right there make that nice deep cut and we start pulling out the organs. The first organ because of the location is probably these large and small intestines. Right there. Everyone has them, everyone uses them, and let's hear from our experts while Hoyt dries them off about why the intestines are important. Here we go. The next organ after the stomach is the small intestine. Does it really look that small? No, that's pretty big. Looks, looks, I mean, take a lot of space. If I yeah. lean back a bit and squint my eyes, Man, kind of. Why do you think it would be called the small intestine? Um, the diameter of the tube? That's a great observation, Mr. McQuiggan. It's great. Family. Why do we call it the first intestine? We should. That's a good point. It would probably be easier. Best intestine. How long mm -hmm. is it? If I remember correctly, is it approximately five times the height of your body? Um, no, three times. Three times. Three, three times, times, times the length times. of your body. Three times the height of the length of your body. Which is crazy. That all gets jammed and fits right in here. Right in so, the gut. I think we all can agree that Miss Lee's kind of a short person. So she'd probably have a shorter, smaller intestine than, say, Mr. Langle, who's 
a giant, really. But still, Miss Lee's small intestine would probably be one and a half lengths of Mr. Langle. Probably. Kind of insane to think about, right? That could be, yeah. Kind of cool. Yeah. And that's where all of your, most of your nutrients are absorbed, right? Your stomach breaks down the food, and it gets into your small intestine, and then the nutrients get absorbed through the walls of that tube. So why does it have to be so long? So that why can't it just be short? Good question. I'm guessing it's because it's got to break down more, so that you make sure that all your food gets breaking down. Mm. Is that what you have read? If I remember correctly, I think they talked That's about I think they talked about surface area in math class. Mm. Oh yeah. Mm. It's like yeah. it's like the amount of surface area. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right class. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what, that one has more surface area. Yeah. It gives it a better chance to absorb more nutrients. Yeah. Mm. That's I good. See. So the more so you, places where the food touches, the more likely it's able to absorb. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And if it was too short, you'd lose some nutrients and you wouldn't get as much stuff out of your food. Dang. You need to have it nice and long so you can have maximum um, nutrient absorption. Maximum absorption! Boom. This is the large intestine, follows the small intestine. We scientists are very creative with mm -hmm. our naming. Yep. The main purpose of the large intestine is to take moisture out of um, what's left of your food. It's a good, mm. it's a good thing. So it's like a built-in dehumidifier. Yeah, we don't want to, you got to drink water, your body needs water, and you don't want to just keep pooping it out. So it helps suck up some water and moisture. There you go. Well, it's much bigger in diameter than the large intestine, the small intestine. Hence the name. Hence oh the name. Oh my goodness. There it is. Sense. I believe it's also shorter. Yeah, it looks a lot shorter. It looks a lot shorter. I think it's approximately five feet. Yeah. Five so feet again, long. again, Miss Lee would probably, she may or may not have a shorter, large intestine. It's probably, probably like four and a half. Probably. Yeah. Probably still taller than Mr. Grabowski, though. Yeah, yes. definitely. Yeah. Okay. Last thing I would like to mention, because we talked about this at the beginning of the video, this is the last stop of our basically the journey that our food goes through, which we've been spending a lot of time talking about. What's going to happen after our large intestine absorbs all the water? I think i got to go find out. Okay. And there we have it. After you eat your food, it's absorbed in the, the nutrients in the large, small intestine, the water out of the, in the large intestine, and then you must use the bathroom. Back to you, Langle. All right. The intestines are going to go into the jar that is protected by Kwebhasna. Or, boy, you do it better than I do. I'll try. Uh, Kebhasnu. 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 Uh, this god is recognizable because he has the head of a falcon. Each of these canopic jars uh, meant to kind of house these important internal organs for eternity or for our passage into the afterlife. Uh, would have the head of a particular god, one of the four sons of Horus. Now, uh, this particular god, Kephasnuf, uh, was a son of Horus that had a falcon head, I believe. Yes, a falcon head. And, you know, usually the intestines would be dried out over a long period of time to get that all the moisture out, but we just settled for a quick, you know, quick little down. dry down. The next, as we're going through, remember, it's not cut wide open and dig. It's a small cut so they can reach in and grab because they want the body as perfect as possible for the afterlife. The next one, we have the stomach. Once again, while Hoyt gives it a nice dry, let's hear from our experts. All right, on to the next one. We have the stomach. What shape does this look like to you fellas? A fetus. Shape. I guess we could say that. <laughs> yeah. If you were to compare it to a food. A you? Kidney bean. Kidney bean. Yeah, kidney bean, excellent. The stomach is the shape of a bean. Wait, so why don't they call it a stomach bean? That's a great question. They should. You should have been alive about 400 years the ago. The color. I'm they guessing the color. Been. Kidney beans have the color of that kidney red, mm. just like our liver red. Yeah. What is the stomach important for? Mm. Is that mm. what holds the pee? No. You sound like a middle schooler. Obsessed with pee and poop. Does it hold the poop? Nope. <laughs> it does not. Shoot. Well, we that, will, that was close. <laughs> nope. 
Is it where your food goes? Excellent. Yes. Mm. Your food starts in your stomach. That makes sense. Right. That's Excellent. why they say that my stomach is rumbling when I'm hungry. Excellent. Does it shake? That's a great question. I forgot. I don't I think so. that up. I don't think it shakes. It starts to digest and move. If you open it up, oh, you have little ridges. There's muscles in there. Interesting. Yes, of There's muscles in there that break up your food and chunk it down. Is it like really comfortable inside the in the stomach? Ah, that's a great question. If I were to think about it, I would compare it to a green acid that you see in cartoons. Like battery acid? Mm -hmm. The green one. Yes. Burns the hole through the floor. Yeah. What's that called? Sulfuric acid? Nope. Hydrochloric there acid? There we go. Hydro... Mm. What is it? Hydrochloric acid? There it is. That's in your stomach. So really if it's strong. such a terrible, terrible acid, how do you think your stomach protects itself with that acid inside? With a bunch of snot? Pretty much. It has a layer of mucus. Yeah. It's disgusting. Gross. Our bodies are disgusting. But yeah. they're amazing. And if you Incredible. if your mucus gets thin, the acid can burn the stomach that's and you right. that's what we call ulcers. Yes. And it gets, the stomach bleeds and it's might really have bad. one. I Is that why my dad eats a tum sometimes mm, for probably. spicy foods? Yep. It could be. If it gets too acidic, burns through that mucus, gets some ulcers, and start seeing blood in places you don't want to see blood. Mm -hmm. it's, not Yikes. Very, it's not very good. Like on my elbow? So keep track of um, if you put your elbow in the wrong spot, sure. Okay. <laughs> it could get on your elbow. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we, we want to make sure we treat our stomach very well because it's how we survive. I think Mr. Clemens would eat prebiotics. Prebiotics. Uh, prebiotics. Not probiotics? What about postbiotics? It's, it's for before you eat and then in your stomach they become probiotics? Okay. So you eat the pre, eat the food with the pro, and then eat the post. Maybe. Yeah, that sounds a, about right. It's a three-step process. We might need to phone a friend. Mr. Clemens, you want a pro we'll to post. Make sure we, yeah. we have to touch base with Clemens on that idea. Yeah, I know he's got a really sensitive stomach, mm -hmm. being um, an old man and everything. Mm -hmm. Don't let the hair fool you. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. your stomach. As always, experts, we really appreciate it. Boy, that stomach is looking pretty dry. Why don't you put it into the jar with the God Duama, yeah, Duama, Duamuta. Muta. I always oh, forget I how to pronounce it. Yep, Muta. Duamuta. And he had the head of a jackal. So on top of this jar, this lid would have the head of a jackal. And this would protect the stomach. Yeah. So two of our four jars are full. Once again, I am reaching in there and I'm pulling out the liver. Very important organ, just like our experts are going to talk about right now. Your liver. That's your spleen. No. I mean liver. 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 This one's super important. Could you guys take a guess as to why your liver is important? It absorbs punches. Mm. Boom, 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 boom. Not quite. Oh. Does it produce pee? Nope. Can it make you jump higher? Nope. If what need... goes into the liver? That's a great question. I think it's, you know what? My card here says toxins. Toxins. Mm. Good. Okay. Your liver acts as basically a detoxifier for your body. Oh, that's cool. Mm. It's all so, the bad things you eat. So it's like a, a filter, filter, like a water filter? We can, we can compare it to that. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And your filter can regenerate your filter. Your liver can regenerate. If you really? lose a little piece of your liver, it can regrow. One of the few. I have a fun fact, actually. Hmm. There's an ancient Greek myth of, uh, who was it? Who was the guy? Came with a P. I don't remember his name. Prometheus. Prometheus. There it is. Prometheus. There we go. Prometheus. And uh, he, was, uh, he was cursed by Zeus because he stole the fire. And uh, Zeus told a little eagle to come down and eat some of his liver every day. And every day his liver regenerated. Yeah, that's a great what you get for helping fact. people. That's a great fact. Yeah. Never trust Zeus. Mm -hmm. Never trust Zeus. Yeah, I think your liver is gigantic. Normal. It's made of toxins. Roughly the size of a football, huh? I don't think it's the size of a football. <laughs> Very nice. Touchdown. The last thing is the liver also aids in digestion. 
it plays a small role. It produces. All right, experts. Once again, we really appreciate your knowledge and letting us learn. This liver, because we love to hear me butcher all these names, goes into the jar with the protection of Imsti. 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 Imsti is how I'm going to pronounce this, just because I like to you know, do it differently than Langle does. Uh, but Imsti, uh, the head of this canopic jar, would actually have a human head that looks very much like mine. Uh, and this jar, uh, this son of Horus, Imsti, would protect the liver. Protecting that liver, making sure that these internal organs are transported to the next life. Now we're going to talk about why some are left out, some are put in jars, some are put back in just a little bit, because we got one more jar to fill. Any guess on what we're pulling out next? Mm. I have no idea. You have no idea? Well, just like Hoyt did, just like if everyone breathes in deeply, it's those lungs. And once again, I'm going to pull out from our, who's, what's this guy's name again? Bob? Bob. We'll pull from Bob, but since it's for scientific purposes, the rib cage is on it. Key point here, they're not taking the ribs out, they're just taking that lung from underneath. So experts, why in the world are our lungs important? Let's find out. Mr. McQuiggan, how many lungs do you have? We have one lung, but it's two parts. Mm, interesting. Interesting. Why do you think they're important? They help get oxygen into the body. That is excellent. How do they do that, Mr. Stewart? That's a great question. Well, first of all, you breathe the air in, and then they come into your lungs, and then they get the oxygen passed into the bloodstream in your lungs. This is what your lungs look like. And then you breathe out. <laughs> And then breathe in again, and then out. All day, every day, for all eternity. Oh, that's a lot of work. Yeah, they have these specialized um, air pockets called alveoli. There's 600 million of them. Tiny little guys. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Atkin. And because you can fill it with air, it's the only organ that can float. Did, I, did not know that. Fat can't float? Organ. Uh, Fat's not an organ. organ. And the left lung is slightly smaller than the right lung. Can you tell me why? Why would that be? Let's ask the class. Why, why is the think? left lung slightly smaller than the right lung? Another little hint is they do it all based on the body itself. So it's like the body's left side. Hmm. Yeah, exactly, Mr. Atkin. Why? Be why. Huh? What, were you, what were you demonstrating? Well, I was just uh, pledging allegiance to our beautiful country. And what were you holding your hand over? My heart. Your heart. Your left lung is smaller to cover your wonderful, wonderful heart. Back to you, Mr. Hoyt. So, as the lungs are placed into the final jar, this one, I think we actually agree on how to pronounce it. While it's spelled H-A-P-Y, we're going to say it's the god Happy. Happy. So, this particular god has the head of a baboon, which I picture him smiling. Uh, so, this jar would have the head of a baboon, we'd put the lungs in there, and uh, the god Happy, the son of Horus, would guard over the lungs uh, in the travels to the afterlife. All right. So we filled the jars with four different organs. You've heard the experts about why those organs are important. So here's our second pause and think about question. Why these? In your opinion, why would we choose these four organs? We've got a lot of different stuff mushed up in all the inures. So why these? Yeah. Is there anything missing up to this point? So think about it. Pause. The one thing that's missing to me is the heart. Oh yeah, the heart. Did, we, did we skip a step? 
step? We haven't skipped a step yet. Because you gotta get everything else, especially if we're starting by the stomach. All right, let's look at this camera real quick. The stomach's down here. You're starting down up. Now, of course, the brain is separate because you're not gonna reach through the skull. You're gonna go through the nose. It's very simple that way. But you're gonna take that knife, cut down here, you're gonna take everything out, and then that's where the heart is, at the end of the road, basically. And so, when I reach in and pull out the heart, it seems like a very important organ. It looks like something that we really, really should care about. But why don't we have a jar for it? Good question. What are we going to do with the heart? Any thoughts? Well, thank you, Mr. Langle. Now we have the heart. This is your heart. Fun fact, the hearts that you see on Valentine's Day are actually two hearts sewn together. Hmm, interesting. Your heart is not actually in that shape. How morbid. Yes, very morbid. <laughs> very Frankenstein-y. Okay, your heart has four chambers. It's got a, two ventricles, which are these big ones down low. And two I atriums. Atriums. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. You're welcome. Help me out with that. It, it pumps. Oh. A hundred thousand times a day. Hundred thousand times. This tiny little thing goes a hundred thousand times a day. If you could guess, how many gallons of blood do you think this thing pumps through your body? At least. One at season? least five. At least five. Just five. Twenty. At least. That's probably a good middle school answer. Five. Five. Five down. Less yeah. than a million? Yes. Okay. But more than five? Yes. Okay. Half of 12? I'm going to guess 2,000. 2,000 is correct. Very good. This will pump all day, every day. It will pump 2,000 gallons through your body. Have you ever had a heart? You ever eaten it before? No, I have not. I've had chicken heart. Yeah, it's not bad. Chicken heart's really good. It's not bad. It's pretty good. So if you took all of the blood vessels in your body, how long would it be if you, like, put it on a road or something? Mm. At least here to Steamboat. At least. At least here to Steamboat. Which is crazy. That seems like a long ways. It's a long Am ways. Am I close? No. What? Not even close. What? Okay. Maybe take here to Denver. Distance? No. More? More. Where are you from? New York. From here to New York. Even more. What? Oh, my God. How far? Something like 60,000 miles, what? right? Yeah. 60,000 like, miles. That's like in this body, right here. In that body. That's like three times around the world. I think it's the circumference is like 12,000 miles. Don't hold me to that. I'm pretty sure, though. Hmm. Always Google your answers, kids. I, that probably doesn't sound right. <laughs> I, think it's I think it's twice. Twice. Twice, twice around, around the world? I think it's twice. That's cool. Very so, cool. Yeah. Might not want to add that part. Awesome. Cool. <laughs> well, let's see if you're right. We're actually going to let it dry. Do a smaller mummification process on it. Like, dry it out, wrap it up, make sure it looks pretty. And we're going to actually put the heart back in. We're going to put the heart back in its place. So that when the person is led by Anubis in the next world. It's ready to go. Yeah. So should we pause to discuss exactly why we put the heart back? I would say let's pause okay. to see if you can come up with the reason why a person would need the heart in their body and not in a jar. That's a very good question. So, boy, I'm going to ask you that question. Why would I put that back? Hmm. Interesting question. Well, um, as our experts explain, we know now that the brain is kind of like the central part of our nervous system and controls everything that we and our bodies do. But back in ancient Egypt, the Egyptians actually thought the heart was the center of everything and controlled everything including your thoughts. So, I'm going to add real quick. Okay. Please, think about this. When you are excited, nervous, 
terrified. Is it your head that gets pumping and thinking really fast? No, it's your heart. You can feel it. You can feel your heart chest. like get going. So that's why they associated with the heart as the thinking organ and not the brain. And plus, the heart, I mean, it's not center body, but it is center mass, kind of. And it just kind of all, a lot of stuff goes back to it. And also, uh, in order to get to that next life, Egyptians had to pass a very important test. What was the test, Langle? All right, so if you remember from yesterday, one of the tests was the weighing of the heart. Your heart versus the goddess Mat. Mot being a feather. Mm -hmm. So you now, put the feather on one side that? of the scale, the heart on the other. And then Anubis would weigh that heart. The judges would like converse, talk about where is your heart on there. And then next thing you know, your fate was decided. Yeah. You're going to go on, or are you going to go to a place that probably was not fun? So in order to decide if you were worthy for the next life, they judged how well you lived this life by weighing your heart against that feather. And if the feather was heavier, then you could pass on into the afterlife. If the heart was heavier, you're not, not good. So not good. you actually needed your heart to be in your body to even take the test. Yeah, because if you lost that heart between your transition from our, let's just call this altar, to the weighing of the heart, you're like, not in a good position. No. You are in the position of, well, shucks. Um, can you take an IOU or how about this dude over here can vouch for me? And just how we've talked about the gods, probably IOUs or don't worry, I'm good, didn't work for them. <laughs> Not really at all. All right, so with the heart back in place, we're close to being done, but we're not. No. In fact, it is time for our spices. Okay, you want some Lowry, some cumin, I got chili powder and onion, all right? You want it really spicy, really nice. Now, you're drying out the top of the body, but you're also going to be reaching in and putting that spice in there. You're rinsing the body with their ceremonial wine. You're rinsing the body with these spices. So I like to think it, picture it, as when me and my dad are about to cook Sunday dinner and we are smoking a brisket or something. We are putting all these spices together. We are making sure that slab of meat is going to taste real good. Now, obviously, they're not going to eat this month. That would just be weird and gross. And they stopped cannibalism a long time ago. But they are making sure that spices really dries it out. Think about those of you who've made beef jerky, deer jerky, um, those of you who've dried out fruit. You've got to get that moisture out. And this spot, uh, this sun. Yeah, spice, salt, all that stuff, perfect way to do so. Yeah, and while we think that the mummies look kind of leathery after 3,000 years, that's about as close to lifelike as you can get. And it's because of how they perfected this process of drying it out and curing and preserving and embalming. Not everyone can look as good as Hoyt after 3,000 years on this earth. No. So the dried out mummification was the best possible Scenario. They would let that sit and dry out for 70 days. So wait, we'll just leave for 70 days and come back. All right, they're back. Body right now should be pretty dried out. He still is wearing the same getup. I, I, I have like five sets of clothes, you know. <laughs> Who knows? But the body's pretty dried out. It's not going to look like this. This is still pretty fresh, uh, human-like body. It's going to be a lot thinner. It's going to be a lot uh, re uh, leathery, not wrinkly, more leather. But it's going to be ready for the next step, and that is wrapping it up and putting it into the cup. Now, here's where my not understanding of wanting to touch dead people comes into play. Like, there's some people who want to be morticians, forensic scientists, all that. Not for me. You're going to be up close and personal with this person when you're wrapping them in mummy, aren't you? Absolutely. Like, there's no way you can just wrap it nice and neat. No, you're going to get in there 
and probably really push this guy around. Luckily, he's dead, so he's not going to fight much back. But to save us issues and trouble, we'll just stand up our Bob. volunteer right here. Bob. Bob. Good old Bob. This is all going to be covered with actual human skin. I would have sewn up my uh, cut. The whole head would be shown. And as you can see, Hoyt getting the linens ready. We're just going to start wrapping. We've all done this. We've all seen the Minute to Win It games. And it's just a process that's going to take a while. We're not experts at this process. This is actually our first presentation. And King Bob here, our good old Egyptian pharaoh, made a mistake of hiring a head priest. This guy. Who is actually very cheap and bought like half ply toilet paper for this job. Uh, their linen would actually be a lot better. It would be more cloth-like than paper-like. They make half-ply toilet paper? I well, single-ply was the uh, thing. Well, as you know, the old saying goes, if you use more than one square, you're being wasteful. So, jeez. Oh, Glad I didn't grow up in that house. <laughs> we got to save whatever we can. And they would just wrap and wrap and wrap. Now, Hoyt's doing different methods, different areas. They are probably going to be fairly good professionals. You just got to remember, we're not ancient Egyptian priests who know the spells, the rituals, and have practiced this a long, long time. We are the people who are teaching you and who call in experts, aka Mr. Stewart, Mr. Atkin, Mr. McQuiggan. We rely on those experts to help us understand the organs, the science part. And as you see, Hoyt's now getting into rhythm. The ancient priest would probably have more than just two middle school teachers doing this. They would have multiple people making sure it was everything perfect. The arms cross across the chest, kind of doing the Wakanda forever signal. This is going to, if that movie ever goes out of style, this video is not going to make sense. But hopefully, it's a good one. I like it a lot. It is. Um, and then just. Nice, tight wrapping. You can see Hoyt's got some gaps, got some air in it, which for our demonstration today, we'll forgive him for. And as you can see, their toilet paper, aka linen, would not be ripping as easily as ours is. Let's see here, Hoyt. Anything else we should add about mummification? Um, I just want to just uh, kind of point out like the links that they're going to to prepare for the afterlife. Not only are they, uh, you know, paying uh, forward for this whole mummification process, but just preparing their tomb, um, having a place for their tomb, for their body to be put to rest. Uh, their belief in the afterlife was so strong that they were willing to pour a lot of resources and time into ensuring that they would actually get to this next life. Yeah, it was very, very important to them. It was a very, it showed the development of ancient Egypt quite a bit. Absolutely. And if you have been paying attention, this kind of sounds like a test question. It does. Who knows? Who knows? Probably. Probably. But, as we finish up, as Hoyt's doing a lovely job of making King Bob ready for the next world, just break it down. Why did they mummify? Why did they use this technique? because it was their perfect way of drying out that body, preserving it as human-like as possible to go to that afterlife. The jars you see in front of us were used to hold the various gods and goddesses so that they were able to protect those organs. You were able to see that this drying out process allowed the body to not decay, not disappear. It was the way they proved that their pharaoh was ready for the next life. Well, uh, I think it's been the 70 days. We got the linens all wrapped around. We got the organs in the canopic jars. Are we ready to uh, put it in the coffin? Well, that's the last thing to do. So this would be all kind of in the tomb, the pyramid, the final rites. Now, of course, while we're doing this, we would not be talking to you as a student. We were doing rituals, prayers, spells, all that stuff to make sure this body was perfect. We would actually be dressed 
were not like this, believe it or not. They would be dressed like Anubis. They would wear uh, jackal masks. They would wear um, nicer robes, just as a bit more ceremonial, more perfected, perfected way of life. Yeah, this wasn't magical to them. It was science to them. And this was their way of, uh, you know, uh, going to the next world. And so, King Bub, hopefully you have a good afterlife. Uh, and don't forget to make sure these jars 